Wow. John, what'd you do with everybody? Huh? Should we blame you? No, I'm still here. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. All right. We're going to start a, a new study today. I want you to turn to the book of Jude. Now, I couldn't make up my mind if I wanted to teach from the book of Jude or from the book of Ruth. Uh, I'm Jonah, I'm sorry. Uh, one of these days, I'm going to finish the book of Jonah. I have made three attempts to teach the book of Jonah. And I get a couple of chapters into it, and then that's as far as I get. So one of these days, maybe next after Jude, that's what we'll do. <clears throat> Jude is a very short book, but a very important book. Let me read. I'll read four verses. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God, the Father, and preserve in Jesus Christ and call. Mercy unto you, peace, love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it needs, it, is that it or if? It was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly con, uh, contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men, crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we'll stop there. Uh, if we cover these four verses, we'll be doing good. One good thing about teaching Sunday school, if I don't get it done today, we'll get it done next Sunday. So that, that'll, I hope that'll work out good for us. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the word of God. And we thank you, Lord, that we can preach it and teach it. Lord, I pray you'd make application to our lives that we might be better servants, that we'd be better Christians, and that we would honor our Lord and Savior. I pray for those who are on their way that you'd protect them. And Lord, I ask that you give us a good morning, a day of worship and praise and thankfulness. Bless this Sunday school lesson. Bless the message to follow as preacher brings it to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, Jude is where we are. Hello there, folks. We're at Jude, and we're going to use four verses this morning. Jude was one of the half-brothers of the Lord Jesus Christ, and, of course, brother to James. Uh, the, my goodness, I can't even read my own writing. Uh, he wrote to Jewish believers, Messianic believers, as we would say, who believed in the Old Testament scriptures. So when Jude writes, he's writing with the Old Testament in mind. He's teaching them. Uh, from a historical point of view, uh, we find the Exodus in verse 5. We find Satan's rebellion in verse 6. Sodom and Gomorrah in verse 7. Moses' death is mentioned in verse 9. Uh, Cain is mentioned in verse 11. Balaam is mentioned in verse 11. Korah is also mentioned in verse 11. Uh, Enoch in verse 14 and 15. And then, of course, Adam in verse 14. Now, the purpose of the book of Judah was to warn believers, to encourage them and uh, to teach them. Now, uh, Jude uses similar references or understanding the same as 2 Peter. Both men are talking about end times. Both men are talking about heresy. 
both men are mentioning things that are taking place in the last days. Now, apostasy is rampant. We see it in churches. We see it in Christians. And we're not exempt. We have to be careful. Uh, it's easy to drift into complacency, yeah. uh, to drift into a formal religion where that we try to satisfy the people instead of trying to satisfy God. Now, there are eight men in the Bible who have the name Judas. Now, Judas is the English form of the, of the name Jude or Jude is the English form of Judas. Uh, he, he, as I said, was the brother of James. They're, uh, they're half brothers to the Lord Jesus, if you understand what I'm talking about. Uh, many believe that it was written around AD uh, 66 to 89. Uh, Second Peter was probably written afterwards, but both books were written before the destruction of Jerusalem. They are still in Jerusalem at this time. Uh, we notice that uh, Jude provides an in-depth study of what is true and false doctrine. Now, when we talk about doctrine, uh, this always raises people's emotions. Uh, when we say doctrine, a lot of folk begin to think of in terms of, uh, I don't want to hear that because uh, that divides people. And that's true. Doctrine does divide people. But what we need to understand is that the Bible gives us instructions how we to live the Christian life. And we must follow the scriptures. And so if we follow the scriptures, then we can say in reality that doctrine does divide. That's why you have so many denominations. Uh, we, we see it all the time. Uh, how much worse can it get, though, when we think about true believers? Uh, we think it's bad, but Jude thought it was bad. Mm -hmm. Peter thought it was bad, and it's getting worse. Uh, now, let me give you some background information. Uh, and again, I don't know what I'm going to do about this. I, I didn't bring my big paper with me today. I thought I had a big enough script that I could read it. Uh, Jude writes the book of uh, Jude, and he writes it to the Jews. Now, you've got to understand, the Jews believed the Scriptures. They didn't believe the New Testament, but they believed the Old Testament. And so Jude is trying to warn them and to encourage them and to help them. And so he uses these texts to refute corrupt teachers. There's always been bad teaching. Jesus faced it. Paul faced it. The apostles did. Now, everybody can't be right. Now, I, I think we're right. Uh, we, but we might get to heaven and find out, hey, we missed that one. <laughs> I hope not, but that's reality. But Jude gives the only record of the scriptures of uh, the condition, the contents over the, the conflict, I should say, over the body of Moses. You won't find that any place else. Uh, the devil tried to steal the body of Moses, uh, expose it, and Jude gives us the record. Uh, not only that, uh, but uh, he gives the prophecy of Enoch. Nobody else mentions Enoch in the prophecies of Enoch, but Jude does. Uh, the word meaning keep uh, occurs five times uh, in the little book of Jude. doesn't always say the word keep, but let me give you an example. Look at verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God, the Father, and preserved, that's the word keep, uh, preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Now, did you notice that he identifies himself as a servant? Actually, it's bond slave. He says, I'm a slave to Jesus Christ. Now, Jude is the half-brother of Jesus. And yet he acknowledges the fact that he is in subjection to the Lord. Uh, even though he was the half-brother of our Lord according to the flesh. Uh, he doesn't try to mention the fact that he's a half-brother. Did you notice that? No reference to his relationship to Jesus. Now we know he is because of the book of Acts and other references. But he calls himself a servant of Jesus Christ. Now folks, that's where you and I come in. We are to be servants of Jesus. 
We're not free agents. We don't do what we want to do. Uh, now, when he says that he's a servant, he, he's having a higher relationship than the thought of being a half-brother to Jesus. He says, I'm a servant to Jesus Christ. And that's where you and I are. No doubt the assurance for believers is uh, the intended theme of this chapter. For they are sanctified by God the Father, according to verse 1. Sanctification means set aside. When you got saved, and when I got saved, we became part of the family of God. We belong to Jesus Christ. But we're servants. Now, I realize that we have a holy relationship with the Lord. But we don't fully understand that and will not understand that until we get to heaven. In the meantime, we're servants. Opening words in verse 1 is sanctification, which means kept and called and set aside. And then he has the word called. God does not call us because of our ability, our efforts, our talents. We don't have anything to offer God. Thank the Lord that he saw fit to die for us. Then we might have life. We have nothing to offer him but our sin. And yet God has saved us and called us to be servants. There's a work for us to do. And we praise the Lord for that. Now, whether you have effort of talent or character, uh, maybe <laughs> wisdom, we didn't call you for those reasons. He loved you. He died for you that you might have life and have it more abundantly. However, he has given you gifts. I don't know what your gifts are. I know what preachers are because he's called to preach. Uh, but all of us are called to a ministry of some type or another. We're his servants. He gives out gifts. He gives wisdom. Now, the preservation of the saints is brought out here. You know, when we talk about that word called, let me read to you what Jesus said in John 15, verse 16. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. Amen. Now, the preservation of the saints, we call it eternal security. Uh, it's there. Thank God. We don't have to worry about hanging out and holding on. Uh, God saved us and he will use us and we praise the Lord for that. But that word servant, it does mean slave. <laughs> now, when the South had slavery in America, those men and women that were slaves had no choosing of what they could do or where they could go. Uh, they were in bondage. Now, you and I are in a different type of bondage. We're in a bondage that gives us liberty, where that we can go. We can be used of God. And that's what we see here. Now, in verse 2, we see mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Now, <laughs> mercy, I, I tell you what, I don't want justice because I'd bust hell wide open. <laughs> I need mercy, and God said that he'd give it to us. Now, uh, this, of course, is referred to the saved. Sometimes folks like to use the word elect. I don't have any problems with that. I don't use that word very often because it suggests that there are others who are doomed to hell because they weren't elect. So I don't use that word, though it's a good word. Now, providing a Savior, he also provided forgiveness, and he provided sin taken away. Because of Jesus. Now, I'm a servant of the Lord. You're a servant of the Lord. Our sins are forgiven, taken away. He wants to use us. But unfortunately, many Christians don't feel any obligation to serve the Lord. Listen, we're not just on a, a free ride to heaven, even though it is an escalator. <laughs> but we have responsibilities and God wants us to be usable. He wants to use you. Not just preacher. He wants to use all of us. And we thank the Lord for that. You know, in Romans chapter 5, uh, the Bible says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. That's that same peace here. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, uh, that comes along with it. We're justified. We have peace. Now, because we have peace in our heart. If you died right now, where would you go? Well, you say, well, I accepted Christ as my Savior. Go to heaven. Doesn't that bring you peace? Amen. We don't have to fear hell. We don't have to fear tomorrow. Uh, you know, I watched the fires on TV like all of us. What a sad, sad situation, especially for people who went through it. The fires of hell are far worse. We don't have to fear that. We got peace with God. 
And then the word love. That's the motivation of all that God does. The Bible makes it very clear that uh, we love him because he first loved us. God loved us. He puts joy in our heart and a peace that we don't have to worry about tomorrow. You see, this is all a buildup of what uh, Jude is doing. He didn't intend this. Matter of fact, uh, he was going in another direction. And I'll show you that in just a minute. But that common salvation, uh, <laughs> that's what he really wanted to get into. But the Holy Spirit of God delivered or directed him in another way. If you look at uh, verse 3. Uh, beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, that's what he wants to talk about, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Wow. What a, what a challenge. What an opportunity. Now, believers are warned right here that apostasy would come. Now, we don't think much about apostasy today, but it's relevant. It's very rampant in our country, uh, even among some of our Baptist churches. Uh, people want to be popular. They'll do anything to gain popularity. And so apostasy sneaks in and it leaves its mark. Apostasy is a departure from the truth. The faith, as the Bible puts it in our verse, uh, the faith is called doctrine. Oh, but I don't like doctrine. You can't get away from it, folks. It's there, and, 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 and as Christians, uh, we can't leave it. The apostles' doctrine is mentioned in Acts, I think it's chapter 2, verse 42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in uh, fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Wow. Well, is a small cloud to begin with of differences can explode into a big storm if we're not careful. I got it written down someplace. I may not have used it, but uh, let me read it to you. J. Vernon McGee. He says, what was a little cloud the size of a man's hand in Jude's day is in our day a storm of hurricane proportions because we are in the apostasy of which he foretold. Now, we think, well, how can it get much worse than what it is? Well, it does, and it will. Now, the worse it gets, and the more people involved, the more it will be accepted. But we have to hold to what is the Bible teaches us. And that's what we see right here. And so he uses these texts to, to refer to corrupt teachers. You say, oh, but we don't really have corrupt teachers today. Oh, yes, we do. They're everywhere. Uh, Jude gives us information that we need to know and understand. Let me tell you something. We may be small, and we are. We're not big in numbers, but we still have to contend for the faith. We have to do that which is right. And when Jude identifies himself as a servant of Jesus Christ, he puts himself in a position where he has to take a stand. Well, we, we don't like to upset people. We don't like to stir the waters. But we do know this. That word servant means we do God's bidding. And God's bidding is that we stay true to the scriptures. Now, uh, that common salvation. Believers are warned that apostasy would come. And we have to be careful. We have to see it. We have to understand it. Now, in these days... Uh, we have to contend for the faith. That's why I went back over there. So, teachers who distort the message. Not everybody that has a smooth voice is teaching truth. Not everyone that says, thus saith the Lord, is following scriptures. Now, we've had people come into our church uh, that we've had to ask to leave. Because they wanted to teach something other than scripture. Listen, it's not our faith, it's his. Right, amen. We don't have the right to change scripture, change message, to try to appease men. We have a responsibility. Now, uh, we're to defend what God has given us. It's called the gospel. 
But more than that, it goes beyond that. I put down here, uh, when we uh, have the gospel, we're also talking about the Trinity, deity, the nature of man, sin, and various doctrines such as election, redemption, righteousness, regeneration, justification, sanctification, glorification, and eternal security. That's all part of it. <clears throat> when, when Paul was writing to the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 27, here's what he said. Only let your conversation be as it become in the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries. Now, the adversaries are still around. You stand up for the King James Bible and you'll find out how fast you get in trouble. Amen. You tell somebody that it's the preserved word of God. Right. Woo! I tell you what, I've lost friends over it. I know what I'm talking about. But Paul said, I am set for the defense of the gospel. That's your responsibility, John. That's my responsibility, people. We together are to stand firm. We have the word of God. Don't apologize for it. One of the best ways to determine the faith is to preach the gospel. Matter of fact, Spurgeon said this, he said, um, the best apology for the gospel is to let the gospel out. Change your life, change my life. That's the power of the gospel, but that's only part of it. Uh, now, we see here where uh, we're told in verse four, why, we're not to, why we are to contend for the faith because certain men creep in unaware. You know, not everybody that comes into the church wearing a tie or a suit uh, is a man of God. Not every lady that comes in that's attractive and wears good clothing and seems to carry herself well is of the Lord. We have a responsibility, not just preacher and me, but all of us. We're to guard this pulpit. It don't make any difference who's preaching behind it. Now, I may say something every once in a while that cause your eyebrows to go up about that uh, but that'd be interpretation preacher and I we have some good discussions uh, <laughs> uh, we have some good discussions uh, I won't tell you who's right or who's wrong I'll let you guess on that one uh, but uh, uh, there are people who will infiltrate any church our church uh, pastors false teachers so-called prophets lay people Claiming the word, but not living it. All that has a part to do with it. Now I want you to notice three marks of an apostate from verse 4. First of all, we see the word ungodly men. Now, if they're ungodly, that means they're not saved. Now they may come in all dressed up. may have smooth words. But it says they're ungodly men. And we have to be careful. Second thing. Turning the grace of our Lord, uh, of our God, into lasciviousness. Now, that's blatant immorality. There's a lot of people say, well, it doesn't really matter what you do. God loves us where we are. Uh, you know, you go ahead and live your life. God expects you to do that. Uh, so they arrogantly, I might add, and proudly flaunt sin publicly. There's some things that happen in people's lives that you don't talk about. They need to talk to God about it. But we don't glorify sin. That's what it's talking about right here. And then the third one is denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we could go to 1 John 4, 3. We could go to 2 John. There are several verses that refer to this. But let me just give you uh, a, a guidance from Ephesians 4, 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Now, like I said earlier, uh, a few months ago, maybe six months, ten months ago, we had asked some folk to leave. They were of us. They didn't believe like we did. Now, everybody has their own interpretation of a certain passage of Scripture. We're not talking about that. We're talking about an infiltration that comes where people try to change the direction of the church. What we believe. 
uh, and we have to be careful. Now, you say, well, do you, do you really think that, that we ought to name names from the pulpit? Should we say so-and-so? Well, let me give you some Bible examples. Let me just share it. In Acts 8, 9 to 22, a man by the name of Simon is mentioned by name, ridiculed and rebuked. 1 Timothy 1, 20, uh, certain men crept in on a word, Hymenus and Alexander. In 2 Timothy once again, Hymenus is mentioned, but also uh, Philetus. In 2 Timothy 4.14, 4, Alexander is mentioned again. 3 John chapter 1, verse 9. This is, this is what most of us refer to, Diotrephes, who loved to have the preeminence, rebuked for what he did. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 13 to 15, we read about false apostles, deceitful workers, ministers of righteousness, but not practicing there. That was my addition. Uh, so Paul finishes by saying uh, that they were sheep and are wolves in sheep clothing. Not everybody that comes in smiling is of the Lord. Now you think, oh yeah, but we're so small, who would care about it? The devil doesn't want us to get off the ground, folks. He has fought us constantly and continuously. Uh, warnings of false prophets and false teachers. It's throughout the Bible. And we have to guard ourselves. And you need to learn scripture. You need, you know, when Hazel and I go someplace and we visit another church or we're in a conference someplace, listen, within seconds I can tell you whether the man is reading from the King James or not. But we have saturated ourselves with the word of God. Here's James' warning, or Jesus' warning in Matthew chapter 7. He says, beware of false prophets. Now this is our Lord speaking which come to you in sheep clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, uh, every, good, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewed down. Wherefore, by these fruits ye shall know them, uh, by their fruits. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, Jesus warned us about that. And Paul does the same thing. And because of time, I'm not going to read them. But um, we have Acts 20, verse 29 and 30. He says, after my departure, wolves are going to come in. And then in 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3, he talks about false prophets. And then in 1 John chapter 4, listen, Beloved, believe not every spirit. Well, there's a hint uh, that we can be calm. Just because somebody comes in smiling from ear to ear, sometimes they carry a King James Bible. That, that does not mean that they're of God. Try the spirits. Be careful. We have... Preachers come from time to time to visit us. And just because a preacher walks through the door, Pastor Stevenson doesn't say, come on, brother, and preach for us. He makes sure of what they believe. You see, we have a responsibility as pastors to protect the flock. You're in the flock. We, we don't want you to hear bad, bad things. It, it, it's not good for us. Second John chapter 7, but because of time, I won't read it. The uh, Bible talks about if they're coming to you at any Bringing not this doctrine. So he's warning us, telling us. You say, well now, surely you wouldn't rebuke somebody from the pulpit, would you? I would. I think preacher would too. Let me warn you about a few people. Now if I ruffle your feathers, that's all right. What about Kenneth Copeland? Jesse Duplantis. Listen, I have a good friend. You've heard me talk about this man that gives us a card when we go home and provides our gas. He gives thousands of dollars to Jesse Duplantis. He's a heretic. Benny Hinn. Let's bring it home. How about Brian Houston? He'll song. How about Joyce Myers? The golden lady. <laughs> or how about Joe Osteen? Prosperity preacher. How about Jimmy Swagger? Hey, what's your The crying evangelist. How about Herbert and Garner and Ted Armstrong? The world tomorrow. 
I was amazed. When I first came to Australia in 1970, I was amazed about how many Christians listened to Herbert W. Armstrong. The man's a heretic. He's dead and now Garner has taken his place. <laughs> now let me say this. I just mentioned a bunch of names. All of them teach some truth. You see, the devil knows if it's all error, you're not going to pay attention to it. So what he does is that he, he mixes error with truth. And we focus on the truth and pay no attention to the error. But the Bible says that we're to defend and protect the word of God and the, and the doctrines of the Bible. That's what this little book of Jude is all about. And in the first four verses, this great man brings out several things that you and I need to see. Now, I expect to take about four to six weeks to get through this little book. I want to tell you something. We need to be aware of the world we live in. And we need to be aware of the gospel that's being preached. And not everybody that comes in with a smile on their face and a Bible under their arm is going to preach the word of God. You just can't expect preacher me to be the only ones that can learn and defend. You need to do the same thing. And Jude is challenging the uh, Jewish Christians to be careful. And he refers to both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And you and I need to be careful what we hear and what we teach. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for your word. We pray you bless it. We pray you bless our fellowship and the food. Prepare us for the morning message. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Let's go have